Hey, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. First, let's look at see where the Dead Sea is. There's an area on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea known as Qumran. This was going to be the place where the scrolls were discovered. It's a dry, a lonely place, uh, and there were some goat herders, uh, some, actually they were teenage Bedouin, uh, who had uh, misplaced one of their goats, um, and they were out looking for it, and, and they thought, well, maybe uh, our goat has wandered into one of those many caves that line the area. And so one of the boys took a rock and threw it into one of the caves, and instead of hearing sort of a thud or perhaps a ba, instead he heard this crash and sort of a, a funny sound that didn't sound like a rock on dirt, but instead it sounded like something had broken. Well, it was getting late, uh, and so they decided to call off their search. Uh, I'm assuming uh, our hero, the goat, finally turned up. And they came the next day, and uh, he got there uh, first and crawled up into the cave, and he found a uh, a series of, of pots, one of them now with a, a stone uh, that had clunked on it, maybe broken it, I'm not sure if it had. And inside, inside these pots were the scrolls, these Qumran jars. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, uh, but they have a very distinctive shape. Notice the, the lid uh, to the jar is such that you don't screw it on, you don't push it down into it. And this was actually used for religious purposes because, remember, on the Sabbath day, the, the Jews didn't feel that you were able to open a jar. You can pull something out. That would be too much like reaping. Uh, but it was okay to lift a lid if it was not attached. Uh, likewise, those jars have a very large mouth that render them, it's almost impossible to pour something out because it will dribble down and, and just make a mess. But the, uh, the Jews that were at this particular community had come to the, um, come to the conclusion that when you took a jar and you poured whatever's in it, water or, or whatever it's holding, when you poured that out, if the container into which you poured it was unclean, of course, that would, that would render all the water that went into that container unclean too. But they had additionally concluded, something the Jews generally did not hold to, that it would render the, the jar that was doing the pouring unclean. And so they had designed these jars so that you would not pour things out of them. Instead, you would take a clean ladle and uh, dip whatever it was out of, out of there, whether it was water or, or berries or whatever was being held in the jar. And then you would uh, place the contents uh, into whatever new container. And if that container had to be, happened to be unclean, all you had done is messed up the ladle. You hadn't messed up the jars. Well, we, uh, we had these, these initial uh, scrolls that were found in these caves. Uh, ten, it turned out to be seven scrolls that were found. Uh, the Isaiah scroll, a copy of Isaiah, there was actually two copies. One was uh, the full copy of Isaiah. One was a second copy of most of the book. Uh, there were also uh, several other books, uh, one entitled The Community Rule, uh, a Pesher on Habakkuk, that is a sort of a, a devotional commentary, uh, applications. It's not, it's not going through Habakkuk and saying, uh, this meant this back then, but rather here's what it means to us today. Uh, there was a, a scroll called the War Scroll, uh, Thanksgiving Hymns, and finally what is called the Genesis Apocryphon, that is a, a series of stories and, and reflections on uh, the various characters in the book of Genesis. For example, it takes the story of Enoch, at, and it embellishes it, and it talks about these, these fallen angels that uh, mated with people. And of course, uh, you recognize that, at least one interpretation, from Genesis chapter 6. The uh, most magnificent find, I think, was the, the full copy of Isaiah, the Isaiah scroll. Here you're looking at it here, and, and you can go see a facsimile of it in the scroll museum in Jerusalem. They have the original hidden away somewhere where it won't be damaged. Uh, this became known, and so let's look at the catalog number as 1Q Isaiah 
A, the way you write that is uh, a one. That means cave one. There's going to be scrolls found in a number of different caves, and and uh, each scroll will be cataloged according to what scroll it was found in. Uh, the Q stands for Qumran. That's the area of the cave. Uh, this is Isaiah. So I-S-A is short for Isaiah. And A means that there's going to be others. So this is Isaiah A, but there's going to be an Isaiah B, and there will be other copies of Isaiah as well. Now, this, as we said, was a complete scroll. It has chapters 1 through 66. Sort of interesting that um, there have been scholars who have suggested that Isaiah uh, was written by two different authors and that there was a first Isaiah and a second Isaiah. Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was all one book. It was all one scroll. Uh, and the text therein reflects some, some minor updating. That is, there are certain words that by the time this scroll is copied, um, around 150, 100 BC, uh, when it is being copied, uh, there are certain words that by now have become sort of antiquated. You know how we look at the King James English, and it has some antiquated words. So we, we do an update, and we update those words. We're not changing the meaning, we're just updating the words. Well, the Isaiah scroll have have those kinds of small updates, not to change the meaning, but to just update some of those words. Now, 1Q Isaiah B, that was the partial scroll, also there in, uh, in, in uh, the cave one. Uh, it had parts of chapters 10 through 66. Uh, it was, you know, and it wasn't that the, the writer had decided not to include it, but parts of the scroll had, had broken off. Uh, and this text uh, largely reflected the Masoretic text. Now, when I say the Masoretic text, the Masoretes had, had begun around 500 AD, and our oldest complete Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible is the Leningrad Codex, dating to around 1000 AD. Suddenly, with these two scrolls, they had jumped back more than 1,000 years and yet could still recognize in one of these the, the Masoretic text. Um, now, what's the difference between the updated and the Masoretic? Sometimes it's a word here or there, uh, an updated text, but there were some slight changes, and we'll look at a few of those uh, later on. Well, the scrolls were discovered there by the ruins of Qumran, by our shepherd boys. The, the picture that you're seeing here is not of the boys as they were boys, but uh, this photograph was taken maybe 10 or so years later when they'd grown to adulthood. They were only teenagers at the time. They took the scrolls home with them. Of course, their home, they were better ones, so their, their home was a tent, and the scrolls were placed in a bag and hung outside the tent where they stayed for several months. Um, but after a while, they decided, you know, uh, these scrolls might actually be worth something. Perhaps we could uh, take have them taken uh, into civilization, into, into town somewhere where they could be purchased. We might actually make a few dollars from them. And so they were taken to Bethlehem, where there was a shoemaker by the name of Kandu. Uh, Kandu uh, had as a side job, he was an antiquities dealer. And he said, sure, I'll see if I can pass them along and I'll give you a little bit, little bit of money for them, but then I'll see if I can sell them. Um, he was going to probably keep most of the proceeds for himself. And he reached out. Well, he reached out in two directions. So he reaches out to Eliezer Sukanek from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, with three scrolls, and, and Sukanek was allowed to uh, purchase three. And then the other four scrolls were given to Mar Samuel uh, of the church in Jerusalem. And so Kenneck talks about how the day he was looking at the scrolls, the first, the first day he, he unwrapped uh, the book of uh, it was one of the scrolls of Isaiah, the, the, the smaller one. Uh, and as he up, unwrapped it, he was listening over the radio how that the UN was recognizing Israel, not that Israel was, was a nation yet, but was it, it had begun the process of recognition. And he thought to himself, the last time anybody looked at this scroll, Israel had been a nation. And here Israel is becoming a nation Again, of course, it wasn't at this point, and so uh, the travel uh, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem was a bit hazardous, especially for somebody who was Jewish. Well, Mar Samuel took his four scrolls, and he published them with the American Schools of Oriental Research, uh, and, uh, and so they, word began to get out on these scrolls and, and, and what they contained and how valuable they might be. <laughs> 
as I said, Sukenik had a, the smaller version, the incomplete manuscript of Isaiah reflecting uh, the Old Hebrew text. Um, he also had a Thanksgiving hymn and the War Scroll. These were the three scrolls that he had at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He wanted to get the others and, and eventually would. We'll talk about how that takes place. Meanwhile, Mar Samuel, he was, the, of course, the Metropolitan of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem, and he had the Isaiah scroll uh, reflecting the editorial changes, the, the larger Isaiah scroll, uh, also the community rule, the Pesher Hab Hab uh, Habakkuk, and the Genesis Apocryphon. Now, he takes these four scrolls, and Mar Samuel eventually moves to the United States with the scrolls in hand. And it's while he is in the United States that he puts up the scrolls for sale in a newspaper advertisement. Actually, I have a copy of the advertisement. Notice what it says. The four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC, are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. And, and then he gives the post office box where, where uh, you, can, you can approach him and purchase the scrolls. Well, Sukhanek wanted the scrolls, but he was a bit worried that as a Jewish person asking for them, uh, representing the, the, uh, the University of Jerusalem, the price might go up. So he said, sent his son, uh, Yigal Yadin, who by this time was something of a war hero. Uh, General Yadin uh, would eventually become an archaeologist, and Yadin had already served as a general in the Israeli army at the very young age. He was only in his 30s at the time. Um, and he purchased the scrolls through an intermediary. Um, it, he purchased these four scrolls so that they could be given to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And so they all came to Jerusalem and they all became the possession of, of the Hebrew University there. Now, People began wondering, well, we have those four scrolls, but what about other caves? Might there be scrolls in some of the other caves that, that line the area? And they began to go back and do a search, and it was a little bit of a race to see who could find things first, because as archaeologists went back, so uh, the Bedouin that were in the area, they said, oh, gee, there's uh, perhaps more things that we can get and, and purchase and, and sell. And so it was a bit of a race. So what you're looking at here is Cave 4. Uh, it's right next to the uh, ruins of the, of the Qumran ruins of, of uh, Kribet Qumran. Uh, and notice this is an artificial cave. You can sort of see the, the way the, uh, the bottom section of that cave is very flat. That was cut out by hand. Um, and then in order to gain entrance to the cave, because it's quite hazardous, uh, they actually had to uh, dig their way from the top uh, to get into, into Cave 4. We'll talk more about Cave 4, where most of the scrolls were found. The ruins at Qumran had been inhabited talk about the inhabitation, the, the, the people that had lived there, by a group, uh, it wasn't, wasn't agreed to at first, but most people today uh, they believe that the people that were inhabiting this area were people that Josephus refers to the, uh, as, as the Essenes. They were a group that had moved away from society, away from Jerusalem, uh, to set up sort of a, a communal area here by the shores of the Dead Sea, and among other things, what they did is they co made copies of the scriptures of other Jewish writings and of their own writings. And so uh, uh, they did this in this community over a long period of time. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls represented three languages, mostly Hebrew texts. There were a fewer Aramaic and even fewer Greek. The writing materials were mostly parchment, that is, animal skin, and more often than not, the skin of a calf, although occasionally another animal might be used. It's interesting now with DNA uh, studies that they're able to uh, look at those scrolls and determine which animals were being used, and even where those animals might have come from. Um, there were a few papyri, uh, and there was one copper scroll. That's going to be very distinctive. 
The subject matter, well, there, there are quite a number of biblical texts. Now, when I say biblical texts, nothing from the New Testament. These are all Old Testament text, texts, what the uh, Jews would call their, their scriptures. There were also a number of other Jewish books, and then there were books from this unique Jewish sect, uh, which we believe were the Essenes. They don't call themselves that name, uh, but that's what others call them. The total number of documents, about 930. The reason I say about, I tried to be exact, but but depends on who you read, the numbers keep changing. And part of the reason the numbers keep changing, because notice, I'm not saying the number of pieces, the number of scraps, but sometimes you might have two scraps or three or four scraps that are part of one document. So the total num- number of documents are 930. But uh, th- there's a little bit of disagreement. It, yeah, are these two scraps from the same document or are, they, or are they from two separate documents? And so you might see that number uh, change just a bit. The dates of the scrolls are uh, from 250 BC to about 50 AD with a gap around the time of the reign of Herod the Great. Remember, we said that Herod the Great uh, first becomes king in 40 BC, but he's driven off and he comes back and takes over uh, so that he's finally back in power by 37 BC um, and and perhaps a little later than that with regard to the scrolls, uh, down to about 4 BC. And and there's a gap there where the, the Qumran community was uninhabited and apparently not writing... Uh, anything, scriptures, uh, their own writings, Jewish writings. And so there's a a bit of a gap there. And most of the scrolls are between 150 to 50 BC. That is, most of the scrolls predate Jesus. Now, we're looking at the Qumran caves, but we're looking at these caves. And and I said there's going to be a number of caves, 11 different caves, where we're going to to find uh, different writings and things like that. Um, and here we already mentioned Cave 4 of the, uh, that's right next to that uh, Qumran community. But we have caves going um, to the north about, about half a mile in which, in which scrolls were found. And the original uh, find, Cave 1, was about half a mile, maybe quarter to a half mile to the north of, uh, of, the, of the Qumran ruins. Here we're looking at one of those one of those scrolls, and you can see where it has weathered and pieces have broken off. So as you're reading it, sometimes you have to to try to fill in the blanks and and tell from the context what was being said in the missing portions. Let's look at the specific caves. Cave one eventually, remember the original uh, find at cave one was seven scrolls, but when they went back and began excavating uh, the dirt and debris out from the cave, they found eventually 82 documents in that original cave. Uh, None of the rest were in as good a shape as those first seven had been. In Cave 2, they found 33 documents. Cave 3, 18, including the copper scroll that we mentioned. Uh, K4, we've already looked at the picture of that, and this was the largest find. Actually, most of the scrolls, there were more scrolls found here in K4 than all of the others put together, but the documents were not in that good a shape as some of those other places. And so very often, what you, because they had been exposed to the elements, uh, they were not uh, protected in jars, and so they were in a sad state of disrepair. Uh, Caves 5 and 6, respectively, 25 and 31 documents. In Cave 7, there were 19, all in Greek, uh, which was unusual. Uh, Cave 8, Cave 9, there was only one. We're, notice we're getting, uh, by the way, the, the caves are numbered not in the order that they exist, in other words, not from north to south, but in the order in which scrolls were found. So by Cave 9, the finds are beginning to peter out. Uh, and there was only a single papyri fragment found in Cave 9. Cave 10, there was a single ostracon. An ostracon is a piece of broken pottery with writing on it. And what you would do is, is oh, gee, I broke that pot. I can, I can throw it away, or I can collect the pieces, and I can use that for, I guess you could call scrap paper or, or uh, paper that's maybe not all that valuable. It's a lot cheaper to use a piece of a broken pot than it is to use an animal skin or even papyri. And then Cave 30 uh, yielded uh, 30 uh, 30 documents. Um, 
in Qumran, uh, Kerbet Qumran itself, in the ruins at Qumran, there were found three ostraca, not initially, they actually went through a number of archaeological digs. Uh, I remember uh, hearing a lecture, I think it was, um, well, I won't mention his name because I might, I be, I might be mistaken. I remember hearing from about two or three different lectures that day uh, of one of the digs uh, at Qumran. And at, at, the, at that point, nothing in writing had been found. And they had dug a shaft uh, all the, you know, going down, I'm not sure how many feet. And uh, they went through all the things that they, they uh, had, had dug up and they didn't find anything. And uh, at the end of a dig, what you always do is you always put the dirt back in its place. And so they were just throwing everything back in. And as they were putting things back in and just putting the dirt back in, they came across a piece of ostraca with writing on it. And, and it was the very first. Since then, they found uh, three. I don't know the, if they found the others that uh, on that dig or, or a subsequent dig, but three different pieces of ostraca uh, found at Qumran. That, no scrolls were found there. They were not kept there um, probably copied there. That it's it's the belief of everyone that they were copied there, but not stored there. Uh, and then uh, two scrolls had actually two documents had been found uh, nearly not quite a hundred years earlier, but back in the eighteen hundreds. Uh, two copies of the Damascus document had been found there, uh, but their significance had not been really noted until the same document was found. <laughs> In among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we, we actually have two scrolls that were in this Geniza. I probably ought to mention that term, Geniza. Geniza is like a storage room. Um, I almost think of it as a mausoleum for scrolls. That is, when a scroll is too old to be used, instead of burning it, which the Jewish people would think of as almost sacrilegious, we'll probably take away the word almost, um, or even sometimes they will bury it, but a kinder uh, approach is to store it in a place for old, old worn-out stored scrolls. Um, and like I said, a sort of a, <laughs> a mausoleum for scrolls. And in, in the city of Cairo, um, there is a Geniza there, a storage place adjacent to, to the great old synagogue there in the city. And back in the 1800s, they'd found these two manuscripts, and, and that's not that much of them. And then the final uh, one, we don't even know where, the, where this was found, uh, the vision of Gabriel Stone. I don't know that much about that. I haven't really paid that much attention because uh, we don't even know where it came from. And that uh, points out the problem of, of those things that are found by either amateurs, but you don't know where they found it, and they're sold on the black market, and you don't know if it's real or not. It's, it's very difficult to tell, uh, and there's no context into which you can place it. Well, of the scrolls that were found, notice uh, the, on the upper right, you have 25%, that is 230 scrolls, that are copies of the Bible. And of course, when I say the Bible, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And then notice as I go clockwise, the there are 350 scrolls, about 37% that are sectarian from this particular sect of people that live there by the shores of the Dead Sea. Um, they were Jewish, but they had some very specific beliefs that were not shared by all Jewish people. And then there were uh, 250 scrolls, 27%, that were just common to the rest of Judaism, including, I suppose, things like the Apocrypha, but other Jewish writings as well. And then there are about 100 scrolls, 11%, where we just don't know where they fit in. Uh, usually here, the scraps are just too small. Uh, we, we're just not sure. We can be reasonably assured they're not part of the Bible because it doesn't take uh, too many words uh, together to tell you uh, this is part of Hebrew scriptures. We uh, we know the scriptures so well, but there's some other writings, and we're just not sure where they fit in. Now, of the books of the Bible, we notice Genesis through Deuteronomy. We have uh, 15, 18, 17, 12. But when we get to Deuteronomy, twice as many as any of the others almost, uh, 31 copies of Deuteronomy. And then moving through the historical books, notice the numbers go way down. Joshua Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, uh, only a handful, two, two copies of Joshua, three copies of Judges, four of 1st and 2nd Samuel, three of 1st and 2nd Kings. And quite a bit less than there were of the Pentateuch. We get to Isaiah, and there are 22 copies of Isaiah, including uh, those two very large scrolls that were initially discovered. 
Uh, we have in Jeremiah and Ezekiel a relatively few, six of Jeremiah, seven of Ezekiel. Um, I probably ought to mention in Jeremiah, we've actually found scrolls that rep- that resemble our mass- our uh, our Masoretic text, but also some that seem closer to the Septuagint, and the Septuagint version uh, is actually has a bunch of sections that are left out. Uh, so it's it's actually uh, reduced by uh, some substantial verses, uh, and we found copies of both of those. Uh, but Hebrew text, I'm not talking about Greek text, Hebrew text of Jeremiah. Uh, the Minor Prophets, notice I put 10, and you say, well, which books are the Minor Prophets? The Jewish people, even up to the New Testament era, uh, view, they counted the Minor Prophets as one book. And you say, well, those are 12 different books. Yes, but, and they, count, they referred to them as the 12, but they counted it only as a single book. Uh, the Psalms, lots of copies of the Psalms, 39 uh, copies of the Psalms. Uh, of the Proverbs, only two. Job, only four. Of the Megaloth, uh, these are uh, scrolls that were read at special uh, ceremonial times throughout the year, like Song of Solomon would be read at Passover, Ruth would be read at, uh, at the time of what we call Pentecost, uh, Lamentations on the anniversary of the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and so you have a, a handful, uh, four, 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 only two copies of Ecclesiastes, and no copies of Esther. And that doesn't mean that they didn't view Esther as being of great value, but they probably didn't have as many copies, and we just had, uh, didn't find any that survived uh, of Esther. Uh, likewise, of Daniel, there were eight, but Ezra and Nehemiah, only one copy. Uh, First and Second Chronicles, only one copy. And, and these aren't complete copies. These are only uh, portions of those books that actually survived. Uh, so notice, in this entire lineup, the three books that they found the most copies of they were Deuteronomy, and then Isaiah, and then the Psalms. As it so happens, the three books that are that are quoted the most in the New Testament are these same three books: Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalms are quoted more. Well, notice the of the scrolls that were found. These there were more from these three books than all the others put together. And it might be, I haven't, I haven't done a count on this, so, uh, but I suspect that you would find about the same numbers if you counted up all the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament. And not allusions, and there's a great many more of those, but all the this, this specific quotes in the New Testament from the Old Testament that you might, f- you might find more in Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Psalms than the rest of Maybe put together, but I haven't done that. Uh, I haven't done that study yet, so don't hold me to that. All right, let's talk about some of the other books that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, first of all, the Manual of Discipline, as and this is also known as the Community Rule. This was found in the very first cave. Um, it has as the Hebrew title the Serek Ha Yahad. Yahad is actually what the uh, this group called themselves. Uh, they didn't call themselves the Essenes. We call them that. Josephus called them that. They called themselves the uh, the Ha is the word for the Yahad, uh, the family rule. Um, and fragments were later found in other caves, and it contains rules by which the Essene community were to live. It emphasizes ritual purity. That was the big deal. Uh, and it speaks of pooling of financial resources. We know from Josephus that they held all things together um, in, in common. Uh, they t- put all possessions into a, a common pool. The Manual of Discipline, here's an outline of the book. Uh, it begins with an introduction, and it speaks of the community and the covenant, and then there's a tractate on two spirits, and sort of dualistic, um, you know, the, the spirit of light and the spirit of darkness, uh, and then there are the stipulations, uh, which call for a communal lifestyle, and it tells how the the community is organized and who are the leaders, and then there are rules for the master, and then there's what's called the song of the master, I want to say rules for the masters, the, the rules the master gave. Uh, and then uh, that last section is a, a sort of poetry I probably put to music when it was first done. Here's a section from that. Um, in the council of the community, there shall be 12 men and three priests, perfectly versed in all that is revealed of the law, whose works shall be truth, righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and humility. It goes 
on to say um, it, it warns not to alter holy days or festivals. Now, here's an interesting thing, because in Jerusalem, uh, there would be times when when they might have a holy day, for example, Yom Kippur might come, uh, but if it was going to come either the day before or the day after the Sabbath, that created a problem because you could not, not do any work on that holy day, but, and then you couldn't get ready to eat or, or things like that, and so the Sabbath could actually sort of mess up the holy day. Uh, and so what the Jews would do, you can't really change the day, but you can change when the month begins. So you could, and so they would do these things sometimes for, we know about that day. Um, that might help explain to us when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you say, did Jesus eat the Passover or did he, was he crucified on the Passover? Which was it? Um, and it might be that the answer is both <laughs> because there would be the actual day and then the day where they would sort of have have altered it. And in the Manual of Discipline, they were saying, shame on them in Jerusalem for doing that sort of thing. We don't do that sort of thing. Uh, it mentions the messiahs of Aaron and of Israel. Of course, remember, uh, the word messiah just means the anointed one, and a priest was an anointed one. And Israel is described as an anointed uh, sort of uh, people. Uh, it speaks of punishments uh, by either confinement uh, for various infractions. Uh, for, for example, if you interrupted your elder, <laughs> you might uh, be put into solitary confinement for 10 days or so. Um, or, and there were a number of different infractions for interrupting somebody, for exposing nakedness. Uh, no mention is made of women, uh, which has led uh, a lot of scholars to think that at least for a great deal of its history, if not all of it, that the Qumran community was male only. Next, let's look at the Genesis Apocryphon. Uh, this is one Q, notice, uh, ap ge, uh, and, and that's letting us know that it's the Apocryphon uh, of Genesis, and there's a second copy of that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is B. Notice it's also called as the Apocalypse of Lamech, and Lamech is one of the characters that's mentioned in Genesis. And this is one of the original uh, seven Dead Sea Scrolls. It's written in Aramaic instead of Hebrew. And among other things, it talk, gives the story of the Nephilim. Remember, they are in Genesis chapter 6, although here in the Apocryphon, they are referred to as the Watchers. Um, there was a movie made about Noah a few years ago starring Russell Crowe. And the, the director of the movie said, I'm not going to use the Bible. Instead, I'm going to use other ancient literature. Some of that was Gnostic literature, but, but some of that was right here from the, uh, the Genesis Apocryphon. Um, and so if you ever look at that movie, I'm not necessarily recommending it, but if you look at it, don't be surprised when it doesn't follow the, the Bible. Instead, it's following these other stories. The Apocryphon uh, tells a story, one of the stories, uh, Lamech has a son who is beautiful, and he questions whether it's his, uh, and Noah is beautiful because he's righteous, uh, and the watcher uh, warns Noah of the flood. Notice it's not God that's doing it. In fact, God is sort of removed from the story. Um, now, here's another document that was found. Uh, it's given the number CD, uh, Damascus, and the reason the C part, that's for Cairo, uh, because there were two copies in Cairo as well. Uh, as we said, copies were found in, in the Cairo Geniza back in the 1800s, 1897. Um, and it contains two sections. One is the admonitions, that is moral teachings, and the other is laws. These are laws that are uh, ceremonial in nature. Uh, a great deal of emphasis on the ceremony, uh, not so much right and wrong, but on the ceremonies that you do, as long as you do the ceremony. Um, and so uh, here's a section from that. The commanding one is he who prophesies concerning which he said, for uh, surety they do drop words. They are ensnared by two, uh, by fornication, taking two wives during their lifetimes. Notice it's not just, uh, notice that, that fornication is the idea. Once you're married, uh, even if that wife dies, you're never supposed to take another wife. Um, and uh, But the foundation of the creation is male and female created he them. Uh, so their idea was that not only you're married for life, but you're married only once for life, even if the other partner dies. 
Uh, the Damascus document goes on, As to the prince, it is written, He shall not multiply wives unto himself. But David read not in the book of the law that, w- that which was sealed, which was in the ark. For it was not opened in Israel from the day of the death of Eliezer and Joshua and the elders who worshipped uh, Asherah. So the, he, you know, the document points out, whether it's true or not, I'm not willing to say, uh, but that, that that law was hidden and was not discovered until Zadok arose. Zadok was from the days of David. But they concealed the, de- the deeds of David, save only the blood of Uriah, and God abandoned them to him. It goes on, And on the day of the Sabbath, no man shall utter a word of folly, and surely none shall demand any debt of his neighbor. None shall judge on matters of property and gain. None shall speak on matters of work and labor to be done on the following morning. Not only couldn't you do work, can't even talk about what work you might be doing the next day. It goes on to say, and no man shall deliver an animal on the day of the Sabbath. Now notice, deliver an animal. And if it falls into a pit or ditch, he shall not raise it on the Sabbath. Now, remember how Jesus talks to the Pharisees, say, which one of you, if if your animal falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to get it out. But here among the Essenes, they said, no, we're not going to do that. No man shall rest in a place near to the Gentiles on the day of the Sabbath. So uh, that's why they're living out here. They have to live away from any Gentiles. It goes on, and and here we'll conclude. uh, And if any person falls into a gathering of water or into a place of, and it's not inclined, there's some text that is missing, uh, he shall not bring him up by a ladder or a cord or instrument. If you fall in a pit, you better stay there until the Sabbath's over. Uh, It's a very stringent, much more stringent than the Pharisees even, and they were pretty stringent but a very stringent view of the Sabbath. All right, Book of Jubilees, uh, also known as Little Genesis. uh, It's actually uh, larger uh, than than Genesis. uh, Also known as the Apocalypse of Moses. 15 copies found written in Hebrew, dates to at least 100 B.C. or earlier. Um, it begins with Moses at Sinai receiving the law, but then it goes back to the creation to follow the Genesis story, sort of as a flashback. Uh, and and God creates everything in six days, and in the second week, God creates Eve, uh, and the uh, it takes God five days to, to name the animal. So it, it has the first uh, seven, six days, and then Sabbath, and then the second uh, six days, and, and so on. Uh, and the fall takes place after seven years. Uh, Now, where did they get that from? I don't know. Somebody made it up. Uh, The Book of Jubilees uh, goes on to talk about how mankind learns to write in the days of Enoch. Uh, The angels, remember how we talked about them from another writing, the watchers of God took human wives and bore giants. And of course, they're taking that from from their interpretation of Genesis 6, a very popular interpretation, at least in the New New Testament era. I'm not saying that that's the right interpretation, but it was the, the popular Jewish interpretation. Um, the Feast of Weeks and First Fruits were inaugurated by Noah, not by uh, Moses much later. Uh, and Abraham tried to convince his father to worship only one God, but Terah wasn't having any of that. Um, so that you know, Abraham had come out of an idol-worshiping family. Uh, the Book of Jubilees goes on uh, to mention how Gilead was home to the Rephaim, who were giants of 10, 9, 8, and 7 cubits. Now, when you do a cubit, remember, a 10-foot cubit would be 15 feet tall. Uh, That's really, really tall, but that was in their Book of Jubilees. And then it tells of Isaac giving a special blessing to Levi and to Judah. Um, Those those blessings are not found in scriptures. Uh, After Isaac's death, then Esau comes against Jacob with 4,000 mercenaries, uh, but he's shot and killed by Jacob. Again, that's not anywhere in the Bible, in the biblical text. Uh, very suspect. Uh, let's read just a little bit of this. And in those days, the children shall begin to study the laws and to seek the commandments and to return to the path of righteousness. Uh, it goes on, and the days shall begin to grow many and increase among those children of men till their days run nigh to 1,000 years and to a greater number of years than before was the number of the days. In other words, uh, those really long lives that you're going to that you saw back in Genesis, a uh, book of Jubilee says God's going to bring those. Uh, he goes on to say, and there shall be no old men. 
uh, no old man, nor one who is, and the idea here is, although the text is broken a little bit, who is not satisfied with his days, for it will be as children and use, and all their days that they shall complete and live in peace and joy, and there shall be no uh, enemy, that's the word Satan, uh, you know, I've, I've transliterated it here, uh, but remember that was a title, not necessarily a, a name, uh, at least as it was used back then, nor any evil destroyer, for all their days shall be days of blessing. And at that time, the Lord will heal his servants, and they shall rise up and see great peace and drive out their adversaries. So this book describes you know, both things in the past, and it looks forward to a wonderful time in the future when God's people win and everything is good. Now, next we look at the Halakhic letter. Uh, it's found in K4, so notice 4 q MMT, MMT stands for this halakhic letter, uh, but 4 tells us which cave, and it's in the area of, of Qumran. Uh, found in cave 4, uh, found in six fragments between 1953 and 1959. Uh, they found the fragments, and, but then they had to, uh, to place them all together. And it was, they were given, the fragments were given to John uh, Stugnail to translate. Uh, he began his very slow, very detailed work of the translation. He, you know, this was, this was happening in the 1950s, early 1960s, and he, by the 1990s, he still had not finished it. And so, uh, Biblical Archaeology Review uh, somehow got a copy of the uh, of that which had been translated, and they published it. They were sued. It became a big lawsuit. I remember uh, following that in the papers at the time. Um, and uh, But after that, it came to light. Uh, he had sort of been sitting on it and wanting to publish books about it and things like that. Um, and so there was a, a big lawsuit, but it became available finally. Sometimes you'll hear about uh, Dead Sea Scrolls being hidden. Well, nothing was really hidden, but, but perhaps, except maybe this section. Um, and this was more, uh, not because it had something revolutionary in it, but probably because he wanted to publish his books. Or if you're kind to him, maybe you might want to say, well, he was just being careful. Uh, it's a letter from someone called the Teacher of Righteousness, and it's addressed to the wicked priest. So it's not a friendly letter. And the wicked priest, he's from up there in Jerusalem. The Teacher of Righteousness is down here at Qumran, and it contains a possible reference to a 364-day calendar. That's interesting because the Jews typically had a lunar calendar. Uh, remember, it, uh, the lunar cycle takes about 29 and a quarter days, uh, and that doesn't match up. Twelve of those don't match up to a full year. So every two or three years, uh, the Jewish people would add an extra month, uh, and that's how they would keep their calendar. Now, from the Halakhic letter, uh, and, and, and the section that we have isn't all that long, uh, but here's some of that, and also concerning the deaf who do not hear the law or the regulations concerning purity and do not hear the laws of Israel. For whoever neither sees nor hears does not know how to behave, but these are approaching the purity of the temple. So it's talking about ceremonial purity and making sure that you keep the various laws for purity. It goes on, and also concerning flowing liquids, remember we talked about that, uh, we say that in these there is no purity. Uh, so if, if something flows out of a jar, remember we talked about the jar, uh, it has made that jar unclean uh, because the moisture of flowing liquids and their containers is the same moisture. It's all, they're all connected, even though the water is flowing. Uh, it goes on, and into the holy camp, dogs should not be brought, which could eat some of the bones from the temple, uh, the flesh on them, and there's a little section that's missing, we're, we're pretty sure that's what it's, what it's saying, uh, because Jerusalem is the holy camp, and the place which he has chosen from among all the tribes of probably Israel, but, but, but it ends there, at least our portion does. Now, some of the textual issues in helping us to understand, to get a better grasp of the Bible. When we compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with our old Masoretic text, there are the occasional, they're still the same Bible, but there's the occasional um, place where, where a word is changed. For example, in 4Q Exodus A, notice that's uh, K4, by Qumran, the book of Exodus, and the first of what are going to be several copies of Exodus. The text reads in Exodus uh, chapter 1, verse 5, talking about uh, those who came out of, of uh, Canaan to go into Egypt uh, at the beginning of the Egyptian sojourn. It says there were 75 
and the Septuagint says the same number, so it's, it actually agrees with the number of the Septuagint, in contrast to the Masoretic text, which reads 70. Now, does that change a whole lot in the Bible? No, but, but it's a significant, it's a real difference. Um, here's another example in 4Q Deuteronomy J. Notice how many copies of Deuteronomy were found in K4. It reads, Beni El, sons of God, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, in contrast to the Masoretic text, which reads, the children of Israel. Now, it's talking about the same people. So, it's a real difference in the text but it doesn't change the overall meaning of the text. It's still the same people that are being referenced. Uh, 4Q Samuel A. Uh, notice all of these are for, from K4. Uh, it adds several verses before reaching 1 Samuel 11.1, 1, where uh, it gives the background of the story. 1 Samuel 11.1 1 talks about how, how the king of Ammon comes up against Jabesh Gilead and says, um, surrender, I'm going to take out your your right eye, that, that, that's later on in, in, that, in that passage. And the verses that it adds talk about how he had already come through some surrounding territories and the cities that he captured, he gouged out the right eye of every man. Now, whether that should be part of the original, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying it. Um, it doesn't change the story. The, the story still continues, uh, quite unabated, but it gives maybe some background information. Was that part of the original text, or was that added? I'm not willing to say. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just giving you the facts that, that those, those texts are found there. Uh, 1Q Isaiah A. This was, remember, in our first Isaiah scroll where there are some differences. First of all, let's look at the Masoretic text, where it says, Therefore the, son, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and, and she will, will call his name Emmanuel. And you say, oh, really? That, that passage is different in the Dead Sea Scroll? Yes, but notice the difference. Therefore the Lord himself, and notice the Lord is in all caps, so um, the Masoretic text says, Adonai himself will give you a sign. Um, in the Dead Sea Scroll it says, Yahweh himself will give you a sign. Still, still the same God. Hasn't changed the meaning. And the other difference is uh, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and he will call, that is, the Lord will call his name Emmanuel. Now, his name is still called Emmanuel. Uh, does she call it, or does she call it because he has called it? Um, it, it hasn't really changed the, the significance of the passage, but there are two substantial changes that we noted there. And then the last is, I'm not sure if this is the last, we've got uh, just a couple more. Uh, one is in uh, 1Q Isaiah A and also in 4Q Isaiah B. Um, there are some differences. Uh, let's look at the New American Standard and the King James, which reflect the Masoretic text, uh, at least most copies of the Masoretic text. We actually have Masoretic texts that, that read two different ways here. Uh, in that day, five cities of the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One will be called, one of those five cities will be called the city of destruction. You say, gee, I, did. I wonder why that is. They're, sw they're swearing allegiance to the Lord. Well, if we read in those two scrolls, as well as some, uh, and this is re actually reflected in the New International Version, which is a more recent translation than either the King James or even the, the New American Standard, uh, it reflects this difference. One of them will be called the city, not the city of destruction, but the city of the sun. Uh, so a significant difference, and, and perhaps makes more sense. That actually might be uh, the correct reading. Uh, and then finally, um, in 4 Samuel, uh, 4Q Samuel, and there was only one copy of Samuel. Remember, not a lot of copies of Samuel, so we don't need a, a letter behind that. Uh, and it's describing Goliath. It says that Goliath was not six cubits in a span. That would have put him about all, you know, nine and a half feet, almost seven feet tall but rather four cubits in a span, that would have put him like about six foot eight. A really big guy, especially considering that, that many people were maybe only five foot five, five foot four. Uh, I don't know about Jews, but I've, I've been through some of the ruins in Rome, and your average Roman in the days of the Caesars and so on was about five foot four. Um, so I, I don't want to say how, how tall the Jewish people were at that time, but Goliath, in either case, was a really big guy. Uh, but was he almost 10 feet tall, or was he almost 7 feet tall? Um, I don't want to say, but what we have is the text of the Dead Sea Scroll actually giving a different number for the height of Goliath. 
All right, uh, we want to get close to summing up. Uh, notice that of the biblical texts, uh, we, we said that uh, uh, there's a great many more texts that are, are Hebrew writing, Jewish writings or sectarian writings, but of the copies of the Bible, uh, about 60% of those followed the Masoretic text. About 5%, a very small minority, uh, followed the Septuagint reading. Uh, another 5% follow the Samaritan Pentateuch that would only be dealing with Genesis through Deuteronomy. Um, and, and there are a couple places where it follows that. Uh, and then 20% are unique to the Dead Sea Scroll, and about 10%, we're, sh- we're not sure exactly how they fit. So uh, I put them in the category of other. Finally, we want to look at the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We want to wrap this up here. Now, first of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a testimony to the care and accuracy of the copies of the Hebrew Scripture. You say, well, there were differences. Yes, but they were very minor and very few. And with one find, we jump from 1000 AD, our oldest complete copy of the, of the Old Testament before the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we jump back more than 1000 years. And yes, there were a few, there'd be a, a small difference here, and there, but they were essentially the same. Nothing really changed. And it gives us a testimony to the care and accuracy of the copies of the Hebrew scriptures that we have. Secondly, it gives us insight into, into the Jewish culture of the period leading up to the first century. And it helps us to get a better understanding of the New Testament era. Um, and this, this um, brings us to our last point, the development of certain New Testament themes such as the nature of righteousness and the coming of Messiah, are given some additional background from the story, from looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. By looking at these, we better understand the world in which Jesus lived and in which the church began.